The purpose of this video is to introduce to you uniform circular motion uh, and the dynamics or the forces involved with uniform circular motion. Uniform circular motion is a state where an object travels in a circular path at a constant speed. Uh, so the first question we have to ask is how do we describe the speed uh, labeled here as a red vector v? Well, the speed, the first thing that we can say about it is that it is tangential, meaning at any point in time, in any split second, uh, if the string that attaches the airplane to the person's hand were to break, we would say that that airplane would travel in a straight line tangent to the circle. Uh, so it can be called tangential speed, tangential velocity. Well, how do we describe that? Well, if this airplane travels around in one circle, it has traveled a distance of 2 pi r. In other words, the circumference of the circle. And it has done so in a time, which we define as the time uh, it takes to go in one complete circle, which is also called the period. All right, so we're going to call it the tangential velocity 2 pi r over t. Okay. So there we've described the tangential velocity. Now what we have to ask about that velocity is, is it changing? We well, might be tempted to say yes because the speed is constant. But that velocity depends on direction. This is something that we haven't seen so far in our analysis of forces. We've always been talking about one or two dimensions, always dealing in each dimension completely independently. And so all we've had to deal with is a change in the size of the velocity, never the change in the direction. So that presents a little bit of an issue for us. Because we've identified that the velocity is changing, we must also agree that there is an acceleration, because acceleration is simply a change in velocity divided by a change in time. Now, like I said, it was very easy to calculate acceleration back when we did kinematics and when we were dealing with um, x and y dimensions because we had a change in the size of the velocity over a change in time. We could calculate an acceleration and vice versa. But how do we account for direction? And that's the big question. Well, we have to first agree that because there is an acceleration, there must be a net force. So let's look at maybe this airplane. Let's look at it when it's right here on the rightward-most uh, piece of its motion. And we'll look at it from the side view. So kind of looking in from right here. Um, we're going to look at it from the side. So here it is. What are the forces acting on that airplane? Well, it has its weight. It also, because it's an airplane and has wings, there's lift. And there's the tension in the rope. And at this point, it pulls towards the center of the circle to the left. Now, if we look at it, the airplane over here on the left, we still have lift, we still have weight. The issue becomes that tension flips to the right. So it becomes immediately obvious that we have a few issues here. One, we're not sure how to calculate the acceleration because the uh, velocity is not changing in size, it's just changing in direction. And two, we're going to struggle to come up with an x and a y uh, Newton second law equation because we have a continuously changing tension force. Lift and weight don't change, but tension does change. So how do we deal with this? Well, let's first start with Newton's second law. Newton's second law cannot be violated, so the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. Right? And we've already decided that the velocity changes, so there must be an acceleration, and that also means there must be a net force. Well, where is that net force? Well, that's the tension force. The lift and the weight both cancel each other out, but the tension force is the net force. And that's what actually keeps changing the direction of motion of the airplane. As the airplane moves, the tension force is always going to point along the string towards the center of this circle. And that's, that gives us a nice little hint. 
whereas previously we were able to set a direction as positive for x and y and set a direction that's negative for x and y. Now we can set a direction that's positive for this, this force that is keeping this airplane moving towards the center of the circle. And what we're going to say is that anything pointing towards the center of the circle is a positive force, and anything pointing to the outside of the circle is a negative force. So what does that mean about lift and weight? Well, lift and weight actually don't point either towards or away from the center of the circle. So we can deal with them just as we used to. Um, so in this case, we'll have a sum of the y forces. Now, if that airplane is going to keep a constant height, the sum of the y forces must be zero. And just like we've done before, we can say that we have lift upwards plus a negative weight, and that equals zero. And in this case, lift equals weight. Okay, so that leaves us with the other dimension, which ordinarily would be the x dimension. But now we're making this shift away from x and y all the time and shifting towards the circular motion version of it, which is called the centripetal force. So I'll designate by that by lowercase c. And that is just part of Newton's second law, so it's going to have to equal m times a. And this is the centripetal acceleration. And interesting to note or recall that the net force always points in the same direction as the acceleration. So here is my tension, which is also going to be my centripetal force. It's the only force acting into or out of the circle. Um, and like I said, we also have to agree that because the net force, in this case the centripetal force, po points to the center of the circle, the acceleration also is going to have to point towards the center of the circle. And interestingly enough, uh, the term centripetal means center-seeking. Uh, so that's, that's something very important to remember, is that a centripetal force and a centripetal acceleration are always changing because the object that they are applied to is always changing into its direction of motion. But what they have in common is they always point towards the center of the circle. They're perpendicular, in other words, to the tangential velocity. So back to Newton's second law what we can say is that the centripetal forces are made up of simply just the tension. And that tension, no matter where you are, whether you're on the left-hand side of the circle or the right-hand side of the circle, is always pointing in towards the center of the circle, so we will call it positive. There are no other forces acting outside, towards the outside of the circle or towards the inside, so that is the only centripetal force. And that will act on the mass of the airplane, and it will accelerate the airplane. Here's where we have to do a little bit more work, because we don't know, we're back to our original question, what is this centripetal acceleration? How do I actually calculate that? So a little bit of a spoiler alert, you have the answer right here. Centripetal force equals mv squared over r, where centripetal acceleration must therefore equal v squared over r. Sorry about that. Uh, well, how do we get there? There are a bunch of different ways to get there, a bunch of different ways to prove that. Uh, one way to look at it is to say, okay, I need an acceleration, and acceleration has units of meters per second squared. And I have a sense of that airplane going around in the circle, and I, I can think of it and kind of conceptualize what, what will change if my centripetal force changes. In other words, if I increase the tension on that rope, what might happen? Well, one thing is uh, the radius might, uh, might change. If you increase the centripetal force, maybe the radius gets smaller. If you decrease it, maybe the radius gets bigger. I don't know, but all I know is the radius is going to change, uh, potentially. Uh, what you might also realize is that as that radius changes, the time it takes for that airplane to go around in a circle might change, the period might change, and so therefore the velocity of that airplane could also change. Um, so we have a couple variables to, to work with here, um, v and r, and r has units of meters, v has meters of meters, or units of meters per second, right? So the task comes down to, can I somehow mix meters and meters per second? 
into meters per second squared? And the answer is yes. Uh, what I can do is I can square the velocity, which gives me meters squared per second squared. And that gets me my square meters on the bottom, but I need to get rid of one of my meters, and so I can divide that by r. And when I divide it by r, I'm dividing by meters. One of my meters goes away, and I get meters per second squared, which is the, the unit that I needed in the first place to get back to acceleration. Another way to look at it, this is a very common way of explaining how you get to that v squared over r, is to look at a, actually a projectile motion problem. A little bit of a different problem, however, and it's one where, let's say you take a cannon, and you're on the, you're on the earth, very close to the earth, and you set up a cannon very close to the surface of the earth, so right there. This is not going to be a very good cannon. There it is. And that cannon shoots a cannonball out. Now, in a world without gravity, that cannonball would just kind of travel in a straight path. In a world with gravity, that cannonball will follow a curved path. And if you actually shoot it fast enough, fast enough so that the velocity and, um, and the curvature of the Earth kind of match each other, the cannonball will enter what we call orbit. Now, here's the center of the Earth, and so the distance from the center of the Earth to the cannon is just the radius of the Earth. And similarly, if we draw out towards where the cannonball actually is, we have a couple things that we have to keep track of here. So we have the radius of the Earth again, but we also have the change in height, the theoretical change in height of the cannonball, which we'll just call that delta H. Okay. Now the question is, how far would the cannonball have gone uh, had there been no gravity? In other words, what is this top leg of the triangle? Well, how far something goes traveling into constant velocity is simply just velocity times time. So we have a right triangle here. Here's my right angle. Uh, we have a right triangle if we just set up the old Pythagorean theorem. We get the radius of the Earth squared, so one leg squared, plus velocity times time squared equals radius of the Earth plus the change in height. And all that will be squared as well. So as we break this out very quickly, We see that the radii of the Earth both get squared, or get squared on both sides, and so those will cancel out. And we're left with a delta H squared term plus 2 times radius times delta H. Okay. Now on the left-hand side, I'm just left with V squared times T squared. On the right-hand side, I'm actually going to pull out a delta H. I'm left with a delta H from the squared term plus 2 times the radius of the Earth. That delta H got pulled out front. Now what is true? We set the cannon right on the surface of the Earth. So essentially, the change in height of the cannon, uh, of the cannon ball is much, much, much less than the radius of the Earth. You think about that. If we launch a projectile from the classroom horizontally, the distance that it falls to the ground is always going to be much smaller than the radius of the Earth. So in that case, this delta H plus 2RE, that really just becomes 2 times the radius of the Earth. And we still have the delta H way out front. But that delta H inside the parentheses pales in comparison to the 2RE. And on the left-hand side, we just get V squared times T squared. Now, remember this was a projectile motion problem. We know from projectile motion that the change in height of something that uh, is launched with an initial y velocity of 0 will be equal to 1 half at squared. Well, look at what happens when we solve this equation. We divide the 2re out and we get 1 half times v squared. I'm going to divide by that re now times t squared. This looks very familiar. This looks very familiar to our kinematic equations 
unit, where simply a is just replaced by v squared over r. And so that's another justification for how we get this centripetal force equals mv squared over r. So as we move along and, and do some problems, just remember to recap, uh, we're moving away from this x and y dimension framework and moving towards this inside the circle, outside the circle framework, uh, where we're still going to be able to utilize x, nx or n a y dimension. Um, but one of the dimensions is going to have to be the centripetal dimension, if you will. Um, so here we have an example of a bobsled, and the bobsled traveling at a constant velocity down a track, and it goes around two curves. We know from experience that the bobsledder is going to feel the greatest, let's just call it force, the greatest force, the greatest acceleration, the greatest thrill um, when he goes around a tight circle. Well, let's see why that is. So we're asked for the centripetal acceleration at each turn. Centripetal acceleration, excuse me, centripetal acceleration is simply v squared over r. Okay, and so for the first turn, we have a radius of 33 meters. And we are traveling, he is traveling at 34 meters per second squared. All right, so his centripetal acceleration uh, is going to be 34 squared over 33 for the first turn. For the second turn, it's going to be 34 meters per second squared divided by the radius of that curve, which is 24 meters. So you can already tell that the speed didn't change, the velocity didn't change in size um, at each turn, but the radius did. And so the smaller your radius, the larger the centripetal acceleration. So here you have it worked out. For the first turn, it was 35 meters per second squared. For the second turn, it was 48 meters per second squared. And the problem asks you for units of Gs. Uh, you've heard this before, pilots pulling Gs. Uh, a G is actually not a G force, it's a G acceleration. It's an acceleration that's represented in units of accelerations due to gravity on Earth, which is 9.8 or 10, right? So using 9.8, an acceleration of 35 meters per second squared is 3.6 g's. 48 meters per second squared is 4.9 g's. Now, humans tend to struggle uh, once they get to g accelerations of, of about 10, um, and it can actually cause blackouts and you know resulting death from, um, from too high of g-forces. And the reason for that is your bones are able to withstand a lot more force than your blood um, is able to... Uh, in terms of maintaining its position in your body. So if you are subjected to a large acceleration, let's say an air, airplane pilot pulling up really hard and maybe doing a loop, a uh, vertical loop, as he, as he accelerates upward into that loop, his bones are able to withstand the force and the acceleration. However, the blood, which is a freely flowing liquid, will actually drain from his head into his legs. Um, and pilots, fighter pilots, will uh, wear special suits which are compressed along the legs to prevent the blood from actually draining into them. Um, the idea being that it, if it stays in his head, he won't black out and he won't um, lose consciousness and die. Okay, so thinking back to the airplane on the string example, uh, we looked at how radius impacts centripetal acceleration. Let's look at how velocity impacts and speed impacts centripetal force. Well, you know centripetal force is mv squared over r, and so the v term is squared. What does that mean? Well, if I double my velocity, and I want to keep everything else the same, the radius, the mass of the object on the end of that string, what will I have to do? I'll actually have to quadruple the centripetal force, because if I double my velocity, that 2v gets squared. If I keep my radius the same and my mass the same, then I end up with a factor of 4mv squared over r. And that'll be the new centripetal force. So radius is inversely proportional uh, to centripetal force, but linearly so, uh, whereas velocity has that uh, squared piece to it. And so whatever you do to the velocity is going to be magnified 
in the centripetal force. So, so far we've talked about tension, pulling objects towards the center of the circle. Right? So, rope, object moving in a circle, tension pulling in. Uh, we've actually talked about the case of gravity, uh, pulling objects to the center of a circle. And that is just the weight of the object. Um, but pretty much every force can be a centripetal force. When we say centripetal force, what we really mean is just whatever force is contributing or uh, detracting, taking away uh, from the circular motion or the circular uh, or the center seeking force acting on an object. So it can be tension, it can be the weight or the force due to gravity of an object, it can be the friction uh, in a car going around a turn. So friction is what keeps this car moving towards the center of that curve. If you turned off friction, in other words, the car would just slide straight off the road, tangent to uh, the curve, wherever you turned it off. You could also have a normal force acting as a centripetal force. So you may have seen a, or experienced maybe even, a ride where you have a kind of a circular cylinder and everybody stands along the walls. So we'll draw a couple of people here along the walls. And this thing spins really quickly. And it spins in one direction. And once you get to a certain velocity, they drop the floor out. And if you're going fast enough, you will actually stick to the wall. Why does that happen? Well, you have a friction force keeping you up. You have, because you're up against the wall, you have your weight pulling down. But you also have the normal force of the wall on you, pushing you always towards the center of that ride, right? And so in this case, if you look at it, the normal force is the force that's acting towards the center of the circle. So the centripetal force is the normal force. Um, in the case of an airplane, uh, what would happen if you have the tension inward, and maybe you attached a little elf with a in, a, in an airplane, in another airplane, um, to the to the airplane on the end, and you had him firing his engines away from the center of that circle. And so maybe you had another force, we'll just call it um, force of a little airplane out there. Well, what would your Newton's second law force equation look like? Well, it would still be centripetal force equals mass times v squared over r. And on the left-hand side, tension would be the positive centripetal force, and you'd have to subtract the force of the airplane. And that would all equal mv squared over r, just like we've gotten used to doing um, in the previous chapter. Okay, so for a little practice on this, you have a guy, this is a kind of a classic uh, carnival uh, demonstration, you have a guy driving a motorcycle around this vertical circle. Um, and what you can see is you can see that when the guy is at the bottom of the circle, he has his weight pulling downwards. He has the normal force pushing him upwards. That's the normal force of this, um, this curved uh, platform uh, pushing up on him. Uh, and so for that scenario, scenario number one, you have a positive normal force as part of your centripetal force and a negative weight. In other words, the normal force is helping you move in a circle, and the weight is trying to prevent you from moving in the circle. So, for, so from our dimension of, um, of circular motion, the normal force is a positive force. As he moves up along the side, uh, the normal force is pushing him now to the left towards the center of the circle, and gr the gravitational force, the weight, is now pushing tangent to the circle. So the weight is not detracting from the circular motion. It's off in its separate dimension. We would call it the y dimension here. But from the centripetal dimension, if you will, all we have is the normal force and it's a positive normal force. Uh, once he gets to the top of this loop, he has the normal force pushing down and the weight pushing down. So both are contributing to the circular motion of his ride. And so those are going to both be 
positive centripetal forces. And as he moves back down the left-hand side, again, the weight is tangent, so it doesn't contribute anything to the circular motion, so all we have is the normal force um, pushing him towards the center of the circle. So now, from your experience, where do you feel the greatest weight? Well, remember, when you walk around every day, you don't feel your weight, you feel the normal force acting on you. So that's going to be the same here. Um, so we can talk about your apparent weight, just like we did when we talked about elevators before. Where is your apparent weight the greatest? Well, you know from your experience, you feel weightless or potentially weightless at the top of the ride, and you feel very, very heavy as you approach the bottom of the ride. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, let's just say that he's traveling at a constant velocity, for argument's sake. Um, if he wants to travel at a constant velocity, the centripetal force, given the same radius and the same mass of himself, the centripetal force is going to have to stay the same. And so when he is at the bottom of the ride, the normal force has to overcome the weight. In other words, it needs to compensate for the fact that the weight is detracting from the circular motion. So the normal force needs to be even bigger. Um, when he's at the top of the ride, the weight is already helping him move in a circle, so the normal force doesn't have to work as hard, and so it can take on a much lower value. And so here's one final example where we have normal force providing a centripetal force. This is a kind of classic uh, rotating um, space station or spaceship. This is a, an idea that's been put forth which would solve one of the major problems of extended space flight, which is that when you go into space, it's very difficult to maintain muscle tone and strength, um, and eventually you can, you can waste away. Um, now, if the reason for that is that you are in free fall the whole time with your, um, with your spaceship, and so there's never really anything that you have to support yourself against. Uh, if you begin to rotate the space station, well, you're accelerating the space station, and in order for you to accelerate, there must be a net force acting on you, and in order for you to not collapse, you need to be able to apply an equal and opposite force back on the space station. This is what happens in everyday life. The ground pushes on you because you push on the ground, um, and as long as you do so with equal forces, you don't crumble under your own weight. So if the question is, you have a radius, a uh, spaceship radius of 1,700 meters, um, the question is, what speed must you rotate this spaceship in order to have a person experience their weight on Earth? Well, in this case, you look at that centripetal force, and you want to make sure that the centripetal force is going to be the person's weight. So... Um, just like before, you would have said friction equals mv squared over r, or tension equals mv squared over r, or normal force equals mv squared over r, or whatever the force may be, gravitational force equals mv squared over r. Um, you're just going to set mv squared over r equal to what you want the force to be. You want the force to be m times g. And something interesting happens here, and what happens is that the mass goes away, which is actually a reassuring thing. It's reassuring because you're not going to design one spaceship for one person. You want that spaceship to be able to work for everybody. And so the fact that the masses cancel out is a nice thing for us. When you solve for V, uh, you get root R times acceleration due to gravity on Earth. Um, and when you calculate that out, you get 129 meters per second. So that's how fast the edge of the spaceship is traveling at any point in time. Remember? That is a velocity, that velocity is changing, not in size, but in direction. So to recap, we have that your tangential velocity equals 2 pi r over t, where t is the period and r is the radius of the circle. We have this thing called centripetal acceleration, acceleration always pointing towards the center of the circle, which equals that velocity, that tangential velocity squared, divided by... R. And likewise, Newton's second law is that the sum of the centripetal forces equals mv squared over r, or m times a centripetal. Right. Remember that the centripetal force can be any type of force, any force that is acting into or out of a circle, the circular motion. 
any forces which act, act tangent to the circle can be dealt with just like we've dealt with them before with Newton's second law, F equals MA for X or Y dimensions. I hope this has uh, helped you uh, either review or get up to speed on circular motion. And at this point, you should be able to do the homework which has been assigned. We'll practice a little bit more, and we'll talk about some specific examples of this next time we meet.